All right, welcome everybody. I'd like to start with our uh, land acknowledgement. Our event today is hosted by the Fraser Valley Regional Library. We'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather and our libraries provide service is the shared traditional territory of the Coast Salish and Inklakatma peoples. You are all here for our special Earth Day presentation about disaster in the valley. The presentation will be focused on the effects of the atmospheric river storms we experienced in November 2021. It will include a brief explanation of atmospheric river storms and why these ones were so damaging. The presentation will include some images of sumas flooding and landslides in the Chilliwack River Valley. It will also include some general descriptions of ways to avoid exposure to these hazards. It's going to be about 45 minutes long with a 15 minute uh, question and answer period at the end. So you can feel free to put any questions you have in the chat and I will get to those later. Um, and I would like to introduce to everybody Dr. Drew Brayshaw. He's an expert hydrologist and geoscientist who has been thinking about water and landslides for more than 20 years. He's become an expert in terrain stability assessment, natural hazard assessment, and many of the other facets of environmental geoscience by working and studying throughout BC. When he's not working, he's exploring mountains, working on that guidebook, or climbing some ice. And Drew, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Dylan. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And yeah, I just uh, before we get going here, I do want to stress that I'm going to be talking about natural disasters. You know, um, put a bit of a warning out there. I'm not trying to be gruesome or you know unduly frightening, but we are going to talk about disasters that have affected some people. These were the most uh, destructive natural disaster in recent Canadian history based on dollar value anyways people lost their homes people lost their livelihoods there were deaths of people deaths of animals and many people are actually still out of their houses with no date of return so if anything uh, becomes too distressing for people that have suffered through some of the recent uh, tragedy by all means you know take some time compose yourself um, and I also do want to say, you know, thank you to all the people that came out on a Wednesday night to hear a talk about uh, earth science. Um, I really appreciate it. I know you could be watching the Canucks game or something like that instead of me. And I am glad that you're here and interested in what I have to say. So, um, Dylan's already uh, introduced me uh, quite ably, but I will say, yeah, I am a senior hydrologist and geoscientist, one of the founding partners of Statlu Environmental Consulting here in Chilliwack on Stalo territory. Uh, I've got about 20 years of experience. Uh, I worked for government for a couple of years and I've been in private consulting now for quite a long time. Uh, my partner and I started our own company Statlu in 2013. And yeah, we work all over the province um, doing any sort of, of flooding, landslide, uh, terrain hazard, residential land development, uh, glacier mass balance, any sort of fun stuff like that. And uh, when we're not, not doing that, I like to go hiking, climbing, or go outside. I really like to pick mushrooms as well. And there's slim possibility that one or two of you here may have seen a, a, an earlier video I did for FVRL about mushrooms and fungi for kids. So uh, yeah, hopefully this one's as fun as that one was. So this is a little bit of uh, an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. So we all lived through what was, uh, you know, quite a long lived disaster. We had four separate storms through the last half of November uh, and early, into early December that caused lots of flooding and landslides and washouts. I'm going to talk about what happened, why it was so bad, um, and discuss the, the processes that led to it a little bit. This was called an unprecedented event, but we'll discuss some of the precedents and try and put the disaster in the context of natural processes and climate change. And then finally, we'll talk about things we can do, how we could rebuild and adapt and mitigate the effects of future events so that they don't also become disasters um, and what individuals can do going forwards. So I want to say off the top, we're talking about natural processes and natural hazards. To nature, there's no such thing as a disaster. There's only processes operating a range of scales and with different frequencies and magnitudes. But when natural processes destroy property or threaten humans, that's when those processes can become disasters. So if a tree falls in a forest, does it hit someone? If it is, 
then it's a disaster. If it's not, it's just a tree falling over in the forest. And it's the same thing with floods and landslides. If no one's there, if no property is destroyed, then it's just something that happened and it's not a disaster. Um, so we can plan for those, we can anticipate them, we can design around them, and we can also intervene and change them. We can prevent them, we can make them worse, and sometimes doing one might do another. It's hard to think about that sometime with floods or landslides. It's easier to think about something like fire. Sometimes when we suppress small forest fires, we end up making large forest fires worse by getting rid of the fuels that would otherwise be burned up. So we have to consider factors like that when we anticipate and attempt to control these natural processes. Now let's go on and talk a little bit about atmospheric rivers. We had four atmospheric rivers hit southern BC in the last part of uh, November and early December of 2014. One of the common things I often hear people say is, why do we call these atmospheric rivers now? When I was younger, we just talked about the Pineapple Express. And really, it's the same thing, it's just more general. We used to say, oh, it's the Pineapple Express, it's warm air coming from Hawaii and hitting BC. And that's still true. But the Pineapple Express is an example of an atmospheric river, which is something that goes on all around the world. Uh, and not always coming from the Pacific to BC. It, it could be coming from the Indian Ocean to Australia or from the Atlantic Ocean to South Africa or from the Indian Ocean to South Africa or from the North Atlantic to Europe. All of these things, even though they're in widely different areas, are all atmospheric rivers and they're carrying lots of air through the atmosphere in a narrow band and full of moisture, they're essentially a river in the sky. So that's why we call these Pineapple Express storms atmospheric rivers because it's more accurate and more descriptive. Um, the other thing to consider is that we were in the La Nina cycle. So when that happens, the west coast of North America gets really uh, cold and wet winters as opposed to the other thing, El Nino, when we tend to have warm and dry rivers. And so not only did we get by hit by four storms, in November, but also um, it was a very wet November all in all. We had more than twice our normal amount of rainfall for the month. Some of that was due to the four storms and some of it was just due to it raining a lot on other days. But here's a picture from NASA. This is merged satellite imagery and you can see there's a whole bunch of moisture coming actually from as far away as the Philippines and coming up across through past Hawaii, up across the North Pacific and making landfall on the West Coast of North America. There's Vancouver Island, there's the Olympics, and there we are right there during the first of these four storms. And so the next thing everybody wants to talk about once we talk about atmospheric rivers is how big were these storms? And this is where we have to go into probability and statistics. Statistics to look at what's come before and compare it to then, and then probability to say, what's the likelihood that things will happen in the future? Um, I can give you raw numbers. I can say, for instance, that there was 133 millimeters uh, at Cultus Lake on November 14th, but that doesn't give much context. You don't know, well, is that big or small? I can say the Chilliwack River reached 800 cubic meters per second. And again, there's not that context there. So how do we put it into context? We can talk about, you know, the biggest ever recorded. So the most rainfall that Cultus Lake has ever had recorded is 164 millimeters. That's a little bit more context than just 133. You can say, hmm, yeah, that's a little bit smaller, but tell me more. And to tell you more, that's when we need to go into terminology and talk a little bit about return period or annual exceedance probability. So we could say, well, this is the kind of storm that might ha only happen once every 30 years on average. Or we can say the same thing in a different way. This has a 3.3% annual exceedance probability. And then you're like, oh, OK. To most people, that provides a little bit more context. We can compare different times in different places. I want to talk a little bit just about uh, terminology there. These are two ways of expressing the same thing, return period or annual exceedance probability. They both mean the, the probability that something's going to happen. But when it's expressed as return period, a lot of people think, OK, that means it's a one in a hundred year storm. We had one in 2021. We probably won't have another one until 2121. And that's not the case. It's more like rolling a die. It's like there's a 1% chance in any one year that you'll have a storm that big or bigger. So if you roll a die, 
you might roll a six on the first throw, you might not. After six throws, how likely is it you'll have rolled at least one six? It turns out it's about a two thirds chance. So these things aren't necessarily linear. And if we go back and talk about that one in a hundred year event, we can see that really well. Uh, if it's got a 1% annual exceedance probability, that's the one that we worry about a lot in engineering in terms of designing. So our bridges and culverts and things like that are designed to handle a hundred year flood. So what is that? That goes back to our design likelihood. If we look at a 1% chance in any one year, it turns out about after about 69 or 70 years, there's a 50% chance we'll have seen one of those and a 50% chance we had. not So that is what we use. If we have a 69 or a 70 year design lifespan, that means that we are designing for the one in a hundred year event. If we were going to use something like a uh, hundred year design lifespan, that's when we'd want to go up to like the one in 200 year event. It's not necessarily linear connected, but we never would want to design, say, for the one in a thousand year event for something like a bridge, because the bridge's lifespan is so much shorter than the one in a thousand year event that it doesn't make sense to spend the extra money to make it that big when it's probably going to fall down before it ever sees a storm like that. But uh, we can talk about that a little bit more later. Now that we've talked about return period and annual exceedance probability, let's talk a little bit about location. So this is a two day precipitation map of the November 13th, 14th and 15th storm. So this is total amount of rainfall reaching the ground. And you can see it's got bright colors for the different contours. But what you can also see is there was a lot of rainfall in the Olympic mountains. There was a lot of rainfall on the Southwest coast of Vancouver Island. And there was a lot of rainfall in the Cascades around the Fraser Canyon, Coquihalla Summit Mountain in that area. You can see to the sides, there was very little in places like Seashell Powell River, and there was very little in the Seattle area. So what happened there? It turned out this storm came in at just the right angle to sneak between the Vancouver Island Mountains and the Olympics and bring a lot of rain right through to the Fraser Valley and Cascades, just at the angle that storm approached the coast. So Seattle area was protected a little bit. The Olympics took a lot of it. And then there was more in the mountains there. But we really got hit right here. And that's a pretty unusual thing. Um, but you can also see, was this a one in a hundred year storm? It really depends on where you were. If you were in Abbotsford or Vancouver, it probably wasn't. If you were in Hope or Merritt, it was way beyond that. Let's look at some specific data about that right now. So these are some tables uh, that I've stolen from a paper that some colleagues and I uh, wrote that has just been accepted for publication and will be published soon. Uh, these were compiled by Environment Canada scientists with the uh, Water Survey and Meteorological Survey, and they aren't really listed in any sort of order, but you can see there's a bunch of climate things where we list the 24 and 48 hour rainfall totals and the annual exceedance probability. And you can see there's a bunch of stream gauges where it measures runoff. And so it's our total length of years of record, the peak discharge reached at each station, and some notes about it. Like, was it, what was the AEP if we know it, or if not, how big was it? Um, and so we can see how big the rain, how much rainfall there was, how big the storm was, and how much runoff resulted from that really varied from place to place. So, um, for instance, uh, I said earlier, Cultus Lake's not on the graphs, graph, but Cultus Lake got about 133 millimeters of rain on the 14th and another 75 millimeters on the 15th. So 208 millimeters in 48 hours. On their own, those days weren't so bad. Neither of them is the worst rainfall Cultus Lake or Chilliwack has ever experienced. They had AEPs of about 5% and about 50%. So a one in 20 year storm, and a one in two year storm. But because they happened back to back, one right after the other, it was just one intense band of rainfall that went over two days. The two day total of 208 millimeters had a much lower AEP. It had about almost a one in 200 year event for the expected total for a 48 hour storm. So it's really nonlinear math. You take a one in 20 year event, add a one in two year event, and somehow you get a one in 200 year event. And that's that's where statistics and probability doesn't always follow common sense. It's not like adding two and two. Um, the other thing you can see 
is that, you know, the storm moved through from west to east and it got more intense as it went to the east. So if we look, for instance, at the Chilliwack River, you can see that at Vetter Crossing down at the bottom, it had an AP of 5 to 10%. So that's like a 1 in 10, 1 in 20 year flood. That's not so bad. But when you go up to above Slessy Creek or Slessy Creek where it comes into Chilliwack River, um, those had much larger proportional floods than it did at the bottom. And that's partly because there was more snow in the headwaters there, partly because there was more intense precipitation to the east than to the west. Um, then we can also look at, for instance, if we look at Hope Regional Climate Station or Mount Finn Station up in uh, near, right near Coquihalla Summit, they had not necessarily as much rain overall. So Hope actually got much more rain than Thin Station did, but it's much drier where Thin Station is. And so it was, you know, at Hope maybe like a 200 to 500 year expected rainfall event, which is really big. But then you look at Thin and the AEPs are tiny, like 0 0.01. That's like a one in 10,000 year event. So that's really, it's hard to say accurately because it's so outside the context of what anyone has ever seen in these areas before. So that's a big deal. And yeah, the floods in the Tulamine and in the cold water were really destructive as a result of that and about some other things too that we'll talk about later. But it really does matter that you get more rain in a drier area. It's that's like half of their rainfall for the year as opposed to maybe like a tenth of it for us. Uh, and that matters as well as just the statistics about frequency and magnitude, the climate matters as well. So let's look. These are some hydrographs from Chilliwack River and Coquihalla River. Um, and the green line is water level and the orange line is computed discharge. So I don't want to show you really specific things about any of these as much as I want to compare them and show you some of the differences in response from place to place in these watersheds. So you can see, you know, we had some rain early in November. This runs from November 1st to December, December 15th. It's the same scale on both graphs. So yeah, we had some rain earlier in November, and then we had this long dry period and the rivers dropped. Then we had, you know, a little storm coming up on the 13th that raised the rivers a little bit. And that was just as that was dropping down, it was followed by this huge one that made a big peak on both of them. After that, we had some dry conditions and the flows, you know, through the boat, 10 days there, they dropped back down. But you can see in the Coquihalla, things stayed higher than they did in the Chilliwack. And then we had three more atmospheric rivers at the end of the month, you know, a little one, and then another one, and then another one. And what happened there was quite different between the two rivers. In Chilliwack, they came a little bit closer together, and the Chilliwack's a little bit bigger, so it takes longer to respond. So in Chilliwack, the first one added on to the second one as added on to the third one, and they just got bigger and bigger. Whereas in the Coquihalla, not only was the first one smaller and things had dropped back to normal almost before the second one came in, but the second one dropped more quickly. And so it never built up additively to make that third one quite as big in the Coquihalla as it was in the Chilliwack. And so the Chilliwack, I don't have the gauge for it, but the Chilliwack was also similar to the Nooksack. And so this response here was kind of why we saw two waves of floods coming out of the Nooksack and flowing into the Sumas. We'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. So in addition to location, you know, the air temperature, the rain and snow mix in the watersheds, the way the precipitation moved through, all of that plays into why we see the differences in hydrographs between the different streams. It's not only not the same storm everywhere, it's not the same flood everywhere either. And I do want to say before we start going on to talk about the results, the flooding and the landslides and stuff like that, that this is a case where climate change makes everything I've just been talking about worse. We often think of it as global warming in shorthand, but Really, in addition to warming the planet, climate change makes weather much more variable. Droughts are drier and intense rainfall becomes more intense. There was just a recent study in the last month or two that said each degree of warming makes the most intense rainfall around the world about 7% more intense. So we're 
over one, we're on our way to 1.5. That means where our storms are now about 10 to 11 percent more intense than they were under sort of the normal climate of up to about the 1960s. Um, and there's also seasonal changes. So in our mountains, we see that more precipitation falls as rain and less precipitation falls as snow. Uh, our winters are also getting wetter at the same time that our summers are getting hotter and drier. So all of this feeds together and means we get bigger winter floods, but lower spring freshets in some streams. And the less winter snow and less summer rain makes the low flows in summer get not only lower, but warmer for longer, which is very bad for fish. And finally, adding a trend to what is otherwise considered to be natural variability makes the statistics much more difficult to compute to because we have to look for that trend, find it and subtract it before we look at all the other statistics. So what really could have been, you know, before climate change, maybe a one in 50 storm is now down to being a one in 20 storm. And it'll be a one in 10 storm in the future. These things just become more common and that makes all of our <coughs> older infrastructure, uh, as we'll see, outdated and too small to deal with some of this stuff. And that makes disasters worse. So let's talk about some of the effects of things now. Uh, so rain and runoff can cause, aren't really, rainfall itself isn't a disaster. Precipitation is usually not a disaster. It's what happens when it falls that makes it a disaster, unless it's just purely say snowfall falling on your roof and collapsing your roof, water reaches the ground and only once it reaches the ground and starts to run off into the rivers or sink into the ground and make the ground wet, does it start to produce these effects that have the potential to be disaster. So it's not the rainfall itself, it's what the rain does that makes the disaster. Um, and that's things like flooding, landslides, and then failures in our structures that are intended to deal with stuff bank erosion, sedimentation in and outside of streams, and then the combined effect of all of those working together. So what floods where matters? Flooding is really the same. Everybody knows what a flood is. It's the simplest thing to talk about. But if water is up over the stream bank and flowing outside the stream channel, then it's technically a flood. That's how we define it. But in the headwaters, streams are typically steep and they have a lot of energy. So when there's a flood, it really has the opportunity to move not only a lot of sediment, but a lot of big sediment. So in steep streams, boulders will move and logs will move. They'll get carried down to the valley bottom and then some of them will deposit and the wood and the rest of the sediment will go into the bigger streams down there. This is a picture from Anderson Creek near Popcom, uh, Bridal Falls on November 15th. This flood is already starting to drop. You can see it's outside the bank. It's flowing through the forest. There's boulders here that aren't moving. There's trees here where the water's been higher up against the bank and damaged it, but it hasn't pushed the tree over. So it's already starting to drop, but it's carried a lot of water and a lot of sediment downstream. And when that water and when that sediment reaches the valley bottom streams, things start to happen. Some of the biggest sediment, like the big, big boulders, can't move in these large streams. They just don't have high enough gradient. So the big boulders drop out and some of the biggest pieces of wood drop out. But at the same time, all of the rest of those streams and all the sediment they're carrying join together. So even though the largest stones aren't moving, you've got thousands of tons of sediment moving through the system. This is the Vetter River at Vetter Crossing. The bridge is just upstream here and you can see this is on the 14th, it's still on its way up, but it's almost up to the top of where they gauge the process. And all of the sediment that it's carrying through is flowing down from the Chilliwack River Valley to the Vetter River and the Vetter Canal. Some of that sediment, the finest sediment, the silt and clay is gonna get carried out into the Fraser and out into the Salish Sea, but the rest of it is gonna deposit in the river and in the canal. And when that finer sediment deposits, then it raises the channel bed and it has, means the channel has less capacity. So it makes the likelihood of flooding downstream even worse. Um, the Chilliwack and some of the other streams, the Coquihalla, the Nooksack, you know, they flow out of the mountains, they lose confinement and they over time, 
since the last 10,000 years, since the glaciers melted, they've built these big alluvial fans. It's great for Chilliwack, you know, that's where we get our water from. The Vetter Aquifer is built in the gravels that the rivers carried and deposited over time. But it used to move around. Before 1875, the Chilliwack reached the Vetter Crossing and it flowed north right through what Sardis is now, past the airport and out to the Fraser River near Chilliwack Mountain. It's only after 1875 in a big flood that it flowed back into an old channel of its and that the Vetter Creek at the time became Vetter River. So when these floods happen and the sediment deposits, the river naturally wants to move itself around. And it's only because of the dikes and berms and canals we've built that it continually stays in the same place over time. And we have to do work to keep it there. Another thing that can happen is landslides. And here's, this is Highway 7 at the east end of Seabird Island. And you can see there's been a big landslide here. It came down the hill, a lot of water, a lot of sediment, moved trees, blocked the highway. Five or six cars were pushed off the highway. Nobody was killed here, fortunately. But, you know, Kent Harrison Search and Rescue had to go walking through this stuff in the dark by headlamp to find some of these people and rescue them. That does not sound like it was fun at all. And at the same time, all these cars and trucks, you know, stopped because there was a landslide and then another landslide came down a kilometer or two further over towards Ruby Creek. So they couldn't get out either. Those people were trapped there. Some of them had to be helicoptered out. Some of them eventually when the ground stabilized had to be walked across to get out on this side. And it took weeks to open up this highway again. Um, so yeah, the November storms made lots and lots of landslides. Nobody was killed here, but there was a similar landslide on the Duffy Lake Road between Mount Curry and Lillooet that did kill five people, unfortunately. Um, and there were slides and highway blockages all over the place. Fraser Canyon, Coquihalla Highway, uh, Crow's Nest Highway through Manning Park. And on the other side of the river here uh, between Popcom and Hope, there were nine or 10 separate slides that blocked the highway as well. Um, this particular slide, I chose the picture because it's pretty interesting from an earth science perspective as well as from a disaster perspective. Uh, this, there was a big fire up above where this slide started in 2017, but the area where this slide started didn't burn, nearby areas did. We also had the heat dome last summer and that was really, really hot and it caused a lot of expansion in the bedrock. When there's expansion, rock cracks, the cracks exist that are existing get bigger and they let water in. And so then you have cracking and water gets in, plus you have really intense rainfall a couple of months later. Those things add together and they make it more likely for a landslide to occur. I don't think there's a lot of geoscientists, let alone regular people, that would have said before this slide happened that this was an area where there was really likely to be a large slide. I know I myself have told people in the past when they were in Hope and coming back to Chilliwack and it was raining heavily that I thought they should take Highway 7 instead of Highway 1 because it was safer. I don't know that I'd say that anymore. This was a real eye opener. But not all landslides are fast. Some landslides are slow. And where they tend to be slow is where we have areas with lots of deep silt and clay deposits. These are old glacial lake beds where uh, ice was water was flowing from ice and there was a lake and all the mud and silt and clay that was coming from those glaciers, that glacial flower, the same stuff that makes, you know, Garibaldi Lake or Moline Lake blue, all of that stuff settled to the bottom and deposited. Then the glaciers melted and the lakes drained. And now we have these terraces, these thick terraces of fine grain sediment. So they're in places like the Chilliwack Valley, the Langley Abbotsford Uplands, the Hatsik Valley, places like that. And in these fine grain sediments, it takes a lot more time for water to percolate through. The flow velocity of the groundwater is a lot lower. So when the poor water pressure rises in here, it doesn't cause a quick landslide like it does where the slide on Highway 7 happened. Here, it's more of a slow process where the ground starts to crack and creep and creep downhill and it moves, you know, a meter or so at a time 
And all the while it's doing that, it's losing strength until at the end, finally, there's a big landslide. So in this picture, which is from the Chilliwack River Valley, you can see the ground is cracking. This garage has half of it settled down by, you know, like a meter and a half relative to the upper half. What you don't see is there's a house upslope and that house is also affected. It's shifting off its foundations. There is going to be a big landslide here that might threaten the house's downslope in the future. We just don't know when, only that it's going to be soon. But the nice thing, if there is any nice thing about these slower landslides, is that they give us more time to respond to them. So the residents in this area have all been warned about it, and they've been able to get out of their houses before the landslide happens. So the only fortunate thing here is that nobody's died yet. You know, there's a lot of loss of property, but there isn't any death. If we have to find anything good in it, it's that. Um, and, you know, some of these are still ongoing. There was uh, a big slide on the Chilliwack River at a place called Ranger Run up at Slessie Creek on Christmas Day. That was like six weeks after the big storm, um, but it was caused by the big storm. It just took that long for the ground to respond to bank erosion in the river and increased pour water from all the landslides. So let's talk about bank erosion now because that's a whole separate process that's also really interesting. Well, no, sorry, let's talk about structure failures before we get to bank erosion. Uh, landslides, floods, sedimentation in mountain rivers come down to our infrastructure. Things like highways, railways, power lines, that kind of thing. And they cause problems when we get there. We have design structures like bridges and dikes and culverts and riprap to deal with this. And we design them for an expected volume of water and an expected volume of sediment. But what happens when the water and the sediment exceed that? Well, then we have structures fail. They get overtopped, they get undermined. This is Tank Hill on Highway 1 in the Thompson Canyon between Lytton and Spence's Bridge. And there's a railway crossing here. The highway crossing was here. And you can see the big canyon upstream, a big debris flood came down, blocked the culverts that were there. Water went over the road, under the highway, under the railway. Everything got eroded and washed away. Pretty fine sediment under the road and it all got carried down to the Thompson and left this big gaping hole with the railway track just kind of suspended precariously across it. We'll see a picture of how they fixed that in a little while. But Here's some examples, different types of structure failures. This is Majuba Hill Road. And here we have, you know, a nice house with a driveway. And you can see this is on November 14th. Muddy water is pouring down the driveway and running out onto the middle of the road and onto the train tracks where it's depositing water and sediment. And then it's running further down the road where it causes a landslide slower down that you can't see. So what's going on here? Why is this bad? Well, this is a failure of structures. There should be a ditch along the edge of this driveway to catch this water. There should be a ditch along Majuba Hill Road to carry that water. And there should be a culvert under the train tracks to keep take that water under the tracks and prevent it from flowing over and putting sediment on the tracks. But none of those things are there. And as a result, there's sediment filling in the train tracks. If a train tried to come along through this, it could be derailed and fall over. Also, there was, as I mentioned, a failure on the road just down the hill a little ways. So both of those are structure failures. At the other end of the scale, this is Reeves Road in Chilliwack. This is a bridge over Hope Slough. It's actually a very large culvert, which is almost entirely underwater. I took this the day after the storm when water levels were already dropping. I believe that water level got temporarily up above the top of the culvert. So you might say, there's no structure failure there. The bridge is still in place. It didn't fail. But what's happening here is because it's smaller than the amount of water that needs to go through, this water is ponding behind it. And so that water then saturates the banks. And when the water level dropped, those banks slump and fall into the slough. So that's why if you live on Fairfield Island or the north side of Chilliwack, you've noticed that some of our two lane roads are down to one lane roads in places. It's because the other lane of the road fell into the slough as a result of things like under design of the culvert structures. Let's look at the other end of the scale. We've already seen some similar types of things. But here is 
This, if you've ever been hiked up the uh, Abbey Grind or the Sumas Grind on Sumas Mountain, this is the bridge that takes you across to get there. This is the Sumas River when it flooded and the Sumas River came up. This was a wooden bridge. The bridge here is not underwater. It has just been carried away by high water levels. It floated. That's a really obvious structure failure. A less obvious, well, more obvious one in a different way is this jackass mountain photo. Again, this is on Highway 1 between Boston Bar and Lytton. Uh, and it's very similar to that Tank Hill uh, picture we saw earlier. Water and sediment flowed down. You know, there was a culvert that was undersized. The culvert got blocked. Everything got filled in with sediment and then water started running out onto the surface of the highway. First of all, it flowed down here, flowed off the highway here, made a big hole here in the fine sediments. Then it washed out here and just started digging its way down and really fine sediment underneath. They built this highway in, you know, the 50s, the 60s, and they used that for fill because it was what was available. If they'd used lock blocks or coarser sediment or something like that, it might have been more resistant to erosion and might not have made such a big hole. They're still fixing this five months later. I drove by, up, across it last week and it's single lane with a little Bailey Bridge spanning this thing, and it'll probably be another couple months before they fix it. Now let's talk about bank erosion. I knew we were going to get here eventually. So one thing we saw a lot of in this event was that even though the floods, say on the lower Chilliwack or the lower Coquihalla, weren't the largest floods on record, they were more damaging than previous large floods. Why is that? More than anything else, it seems to be because the amount of fine sediment that was carried in these floods. So in the headwaters, there was larger floods. We already talked about those mountain streams bringing sediment down to the valley bottom streams. And when there's a lot of fine sediment in these valley bottom streams, they become more capable of carrying large sediment. The fine sediment acts like a lubricant. It gets in the holes between boulders, between pieces of riprap, and it also makes the water heavier. So it has more force when it pushes. And so even though these weren't the biggest floods on record, um, in areas like this is uh, the Slessy Park clay sludge just upstream of Slessy Park, there used to be three or 400 meters of riprap protecting the bank where this clay is. And it survived the 2006 flood, which is the largest flood on record, just fine. But this flood, even though it wasn't so big because it had so much sediment in it, just carried all of those boulders away and didn't leave anything behind. Here's Highway 8 between Lit, or between, sorry, uh, Merritt and Spence's Bridge. And there were nine or 10 places like this where the river just carved its way right into the riverbank and took away the highway and just left, you know, broken asphalt behind. Uh, and so, yeah, these were in some cases big floods, in some cases small floods. But what was really noticeable about this event was how damaging they were. And we also had what's called channel avulsion or channels migration. So Streams have a floodplain and they like to move around on that floodplain. Usually it's a pretty gradual process. It moves, you know, the bank moves, you know, like maybe 10 centimeters or so in a year on average. And over time, the river kind of creeps across its floodplain and back. But in this big flood, we had some big events. So these are two pictures of the same thing. This is the Chilliwack River Valley, September 2021 and April 2022. And we can see that right here, during the November storm, it burst its banks and the river decided to flow through here instead and out this way. So now it's going almost directly like this across here. This farmer lost, you know, probably more than half of their field because the river goes right like that now. It flowed right against Chilliwack Lake Road. It nearly took out the road. Emergency crews had to get in there and do some quick repairs to prevent that. And you can also see if you compare the before to the after, the stream, even upstream where there wasn't an avulsion, it's a lot wider. Not only is the stream channel wider, the bankful width is a lot wider too. That's because of all the gravel and all the sediment uh, brought in. So not only does it move, it gets wider and it gets less vegetated as well. There's more gravel around. Let's talk specifically about that a little bit more. So sedimentation, we already talked a little bit about alluvial fans and stream channels, but these are just some more examples of it. This is Anderson Creek near Popcom, which we've seen already. This is not the highway bridge. This is next to the highway bridge on Popcom Road, but you can see 
this channel used to be a couple meters deep here, and it's all been filled in with sand and gravel from upstream. There's less than 20 centimeters of headboard right here at this bridge crossing. So if another flood was to happen, this bridge no longer has the capacity to deal with it. If it doesn't get dug out and maintained, then that it will, could fail and get washed away. Here is the Chilliwack River downstream of, Sle of the Slessy Park clay slides, but still upstream of Slessy Park. You can see it's a lot wider now than it used to be. You can see wood has been pushed up against the bank by the flood, knocked down the forest. On this side, you know, the flood's been pushed against the bank and there's actually been secondary landslides caused by that. And not only is it a lot wider, there's a lot more sediment than it used to be. There's less riparian forest. All of these things make it worse fish habitat as well. And the level of the channel here has actually raised up by probably up to a meter or so in some places compared to where it was before the flood. So sedimentation is kind of the last of the big problems we're talking about. And now we'll talk about combination effects. And I want to talk specifically a little bit about the Nooksack and the Chilliwack, and then to compare them to the cold water in Merritt. But I wanted to do a bit of an overview first. Excuse me. So, you know, here we are, Chilliwack, Abbotsford. Here's the Chilliwack River starts on the American side, crosses the border, Chilliwack Lake, then flows out to Vetter Crossing, where it turns into the Vetter River and then Vetter Canal down to the Sumas. Here's the Nooksack, you know, there's three forks of the Nooksack, the south, the middle, and the north, but they're almost like a twin of the Chilliwack. They flow out of the mountains, down to the lowlands, come out to Everson, then they bend and flow around and down to Lummi, you know, and there's Bellingham Bay and Bellingham there. So they take this big bend. These are almost twin watersheds. Here's the old alluvial fan, the Vetter fan, that's our aquifer now for Chilliwack, the Sardis aquifer. There's a big similar aquifer here where the Nooksack flows out of the mountains. Over time, both of these streams moved around and flowed in different directions, here and here. And here is Sumas Prairie, where there used to be a lake called Sumas Lake that was drained and turned into some of the best farmland in Canada. So although these two rivers are really similar, they also have some differences. Chilliwack has this big lake, Chilliwack Lake. The Nooksack has Kulshan, Mount Baker, this big volcano covering glaciers that have been retreating because of climate change, exposing a lot of bare sediment. So those are some important dis differences to keep in mind. Because when we start to look at combined effects, you know, the Nooksack, big floods, lots of sediment moving, comes down to the valley bottom, flows out onto the flats and bursts its banks. Some of that water goes over, flows into the channel of the Sumas River and down to Sumas Prairie where it refloods Sumas Lake. The rest of that water and sediment goes down, you know, along the course of the Nooksack down to, there's, whoops, sorry, I gotta go back one. There is Bellingham, there's Lummi Reserve, you know, there's it's flowing out in different directions. So you can see there was a lot of flooding and a lot of sedimentation in Washington state as well. And this isn't the first time it's happened. It happened once before in 1990 in recent memory, but uh, there's some, some things going on here. First of all, is that, uh, you know, for the Americans, this kind of overflow where the water goes out and comes across the border into Canada is a good thing because it reduces the downstream damage down in this area. That's a tricky one. Our two governments are negotiating about it now because the Americans would like that to happen again. They would like to be able to have floodwaters cross the border to Canada where they don't have to deal with them. We in Canada would not like that to happen. And so our governments are a little tense about that. The other thing to consider is that America has more, their endangered species legislation has more teeth. So they used to dredge gravel out of the Nooksack River. And because of the sad state that the Pacific salmon are in, they had to stop that in 1991. So the Nooksack River has had 30 years to a grade. And during that time, in some places, its bed has raised by up to a meter. So that means between it has dikes, just like the Vetter does. Between those dikes, 
there's less channel capacity, so it's more likely to flood and more likely to flow to Chilliwack and to Sumas than it was 30 years ago. But have we on the border done anything in response to that? Have we revised any of our infrastructure? No, we haven't really. And so when we look at Sumas, it flooded, right? Sumas Prairie used to be a lake. It was drained in the early 1920s. And the problem with draining lakes is that it's great, you know, you get a lot of rich farmland that you can farm, some of the best farmland in Canada, but lakes are there for a reason. And when you drain the lake, those reasons don't go away. It's a low point and it can get flooded and it has flooded. So we do things like, you know, we dug the Vetter Canal, we built a pump house, we dug ditches, all of which to get the water out of the prairie and stop it being a lake. But here we have combined processes going on on Sumas Mountain, on Vetter Mountain, in the Nooksack River that are conspiring to make it a lake again. If you've ever had a boat, you know that when you have a pump, uh, you can have two ways that you're, you can flood despite having a pump. You can get more water coming in than the pump can take out or your pump can quit. And uh, both of those can cause your boat to sink. It's the same thing here. Both of those can cause flooding. Um, the pump house never lost power, although it looked like it was going to for a while, but there was a time when it couldn't pump because the Fraser outside the dikes was so high they couldn't pump water out to it. So both of those helped to cause the flood of Sumas Prairie as well. The other thing to consider is that, you know, this isn't the first time this has happened. Uh, in the 1948 Fraser flood, the, the part up to the dike on the Chilliwack side in Greendale flooded. And then this flooded in 1990 and it flooded again in 2021. So that's like three flood events where the old lake was in a century. If we were just to look at statistics, we'd say like, okay, that's like, a, you know, three in 100, one in 33. That's like a 3% AEP based on historical precedent. Our, our structures, you know, our highways, our bridges, our culverts, our farms, our houses designed for this area to flood once every 33 years on average? Possibly not, right? That's something we should have a conversation about as well. And now I want to contrast this with Merritt and Princeton. So this is a little bit different when we talk about combined effects, because what really happened here, not only did we have really, really, really intense rain compared to what happened in Sumas and Chilliwack, um, these were, you know, one in a thousand, one in 10,000 year rainstorms in this area. And they were also falling in an area where up in the headwaters in the summer of 2021, we had a really big destructive fire. And so when these fires happen, they bake the ground, they make the soil almost into a ceramic and it's not permeable at all. Water can't sink into it. So you have really intense rain falling on an area that just can't absorb any water. And that made the flooding even worse. So you can see this is a couple days afterwards on Merritt, it snowed in the meantime, and that really makes clear where the flood occurred. This is the Cold Rodder River, you know, this is the Nicola River, and they join and flow down, and uh, bam, you know, this is bad. A lot of the town, really bad things happen to it. Uh, this isn't just, you know, water coming up. This is the river moving through town, carrying people's houses away, you know, um, flooding the streets, buildings filled with mud for up to over the first story. Um, and yeah, buildings being knocked down, lots of bad things. The other thing that happened is the sewage treatment plant was damaged and the waterworks were damaged. So you couldn't flush your toilet, you couldn't turn on your taps. And as a result, the whole town had to be evacuated, even if your house didn't get any specific flood damage because it was unsafe for you to be there. And many of these people in this area still haven't been allowed to come home. So, you know, Sumas, I think, got most of the attention because it was right close to us. It was cutting off traffic in and out of Vancouver. It's, there's a lot of really valuable farms there, but proportionally what happened to Merritt and also what happened to Princeton that I don't have a good picture of was worse in terms of the devastation. But enough talking about disasters. For the last part of my talk, I want to talk a little bit about recovery. 
and recovery happens at different time scales. At first, we have to do things really quickly in order to do things like open highways to let you know, emergency workers get in to try and stop things from getting worse. We have to get the highways opened again so ambulances and medicine and food can get to people that have been cut off. That's the sort of short-term repairs we need to do. We don't need to do it right, we just need to do it quickly. Then into the medium term where we're at now, you know, how can we build so the same mistake doesn't happen again, so the same disaster doesn't happen again? How can we make it better? That's kind of the stage we're at now. And then in the long term, we have to think about climate resilience. We have to think about resilient systems. How can we make them not just better, but better for everything? And we're still at the thinking stage on those, but I'm going to talk about each of these in turn. So like I said, the short term things are the ones we have to do right away to let the other things happen. We got to get streams back in their channels. We got to get culverts that have been clogged open up again. We got to get highways and bridges and roads fixed up and up again to get emergency workers through. Um, let people go home and start assessing what's going on uh, if they can't return or if they can return. You know, this is the short term stuff is things that doesn't have to be a permanent fix. It's just something that needs to be done quickly to get you in there. And that's fine. This is necessary work. So you can see, you know, here we are at uh, Cultus Lake Park clearing out a stream to get it to flow back where it used to flow. Here's Tank Hill again. We saw this earlier, same canyon, same railway, same highway, but we filled in that big hole with sediment. We've rebuilt the highway. You know, we've repaired the train tracks. We can get trains through, we can get trucks through, we can get cars through, but we've put like one, two, three, four tiny little culverts in. They might not have the capacity to handle that. This isn't a permanent fix. This is just a temporary fix that lets us use the highway until, until we do a permanent fix. The danger is that this is all we do and we don't have the gumption to do what's really needed. Medium term is where we're at now. Uh, we're making decisions about what to do for the future. Can we fix it? Can we make it better? And if we can't fix it and we can't make it better, should we still be there? So sometimes we can improve things and that's just straight like an engineering perspective. If a culvert failed, if a bridge failed, we can do a better design, make a bigger bridge, make a bigger culvert, make larger riprap or use a different bank stabilization method so that it doesn't fail again. We can take expectations about what climate change is gonna do in the future and incorporate those into the design so that it's not designed to some standard that's 30 or 40 years out of date. It's designed to modern and expected future standards. In the same fashion, if a stream's been damaged, we can do stream restoration. You know, We can try and make it more likely that fish will survive and live and reproduce and we can improve the habitat after it's been damaged. We can repair damaged buildings and roads. We can you know, jack up our structures so that floods don't flood them, that kind of thing. Um, that's more about a permanent fix and not the short term fix. Takes more money, takes longer, take more design needs to be done. That's why it takes longer. In some cases, we have to make hard decisions and those hard decisions relate to past decisions, which in hindsight have turned out to be wrong there's plenty of places in the Fraser Valley and elsewhere where people live where under our current standards for what's safe, it's not safe for them to live. And in my job, these are the hardest things I have to deal with. I have to go to people that have been living in a home for you know five or 10 or 20 or 30 or even 40 years and tell them, I'm sorry, it's not safe anymore you can't live here. I don't think it's safe for you to live here anymore. You could be killed at any time. And not only is that horrible news to give to people in our current economic climate, it's really hard to walk away from something that you've invested your life savings in to live in and walk away with nothing. You can't sell it. No one will buy it. It's not safe. But that's a million dollars you don't have anymore. How can you afford to live anywhere else? That's a really hard decision. So these are the type of things that we need to consider, not individually. We need a collective response to from all our levels of government. We need to anticipate these 
and we need to come up with a mechanism to make them better that's fair for everyone. And finally, I'm going to talk about the long term. And this is where I'm a little hopeful because this is something we're working towards. We can, in the long term, not just try and fix things that were broken, we can try and make things better going forwards. We can be build resilience into our system, we can adapt to climate change, and we can try and undo what we've been doing already that's causing problems. So we can build, design resilience into our systems. A resilient system is one where events can happen without becoming disasters. So our river has room to move and room to deposit sediment. So we don't have to constantly mine gravel out of it to kill fish. And the river can move around without flooding people's homes, without washing away bridges and houses. That's a resilient river system. Um, it might seem more expensive, but if we weigh it, having one that maintains itself versus one that we constantly have to maintain is probably actually cheaper over time. It's just a larger expenditure upfront, but it'll pay for itself if we do it right. Um, and the other thing we can talk about is that really there's one thing we can all do that we all have to do globally, and that is to go carbon neutral on our way to going carbon negative. I talked earlier about how climate change is making these things worse, and it's going to continue to make them worse until we do this. If we can't go carbon neutral and then carbon negative, ultimately humans won't be able to live on Earth. It's that simple. When we talk about long-term recovery and resilience, we're talking about essentially ecosystem restoration. And I haven't talked a lot about traditional environmental knowledge in this presentation, um, and that's a challenging one. This is an image from the Stalo Coast Salish Historical Atlas. Here's Sumas Lake, like it was in 1700. You know, here's Fraser River. Here's the Chilliwack River, not flowing through the Vedder, but throwing in its old path up to the river. And so this is a system that worked for thousands of years. It's, you know, a system where the resources are rich, where they're managed sustainably for millennia using the same methods for the benefit of all the people who live there. That's the type of thing that when I say restoration is reconciliation, I mean, I mean that if we design our system with something like this, that's aspirational, that we're working towards. And if we incorporate some of that traditional indigenous environmental knowledge in our resource management, that we'll all be better off as a result of it. And that not only will it help us with the environment, it'll help us with reconciliation with indigenous peoples who've lived here and know how to do it properly. I think that's working for, I'm not saying we should flood Sumas Lake right now and just write it off and walk away. I'm saying we should think about what we're doing and try and design a resilient system that will leave us with a strong ecosystem that we can live in sustainably. Thank you. This is where people ask me questions. Um, I believe Dylan's going to take charge of that. He can ask. Yes. Me so if you just I can answer. If you want to pop, if anybody has questions and you want to pop them into the Q&A there, I can take a look. Um, let me see what we got. Um, there's a question kind of comment from Matthew. He says that his impression was the Fraser River at the Mission, Mission Gauge was higher than previous floods in the last decades. Has anyone calculated the return period of this Fraser River level during non-summer uh, freshet periods. My recollection, 1989 to 1990 and 2022 all occurred around Remembrance Day and were connected to new snow and warm rain, bringing a lot of energy, creating good snow melt. Yeah, thanks for that comment. That's pretty good, actually. Um, so the Fraser River, uh, I tend to look at the, uh, the gauge at Hope rather than the gauge at Mission because uh, the Mission gauge is affected by tides and the Hope gauge isn't. There's about a little you know, about 20 meters elevation difference between the two. Obviously rivers like the Harrison and the Chilliwack and the Sumas flow in between the two. So you see all that on the mission gauge, but I will say that the Chilliwack, the Fraser River 
at the Hope Age reached a peak of about 7,000 cubic meters per second during this storm, which is pretty high uh, for a uh, non-freshet flood on the Fraser, but is also comfortably lower than the average freshet flood on the Fraser. The average freshet flood in the long term is about 8,600 cubic meters per second. In the last two decades, it's been closer to 10,000. So this was only 7,000. It peaked, it went back down. It definitely moved a lot of mud and a lot of wood. Um, you know, there's years where the Fraser only reaches 7,000 or so, but this is not that unusual for the Fraser River overall. It's a little bit unseasonal, certainly. You notice that, that's good but it's not, it's not exceptionally large for the Fraser River as a whole. It's just a little untimely. Um, okay, we've got a question from Lisa. Hi, Drew, I'm wondering what happened to all the road and other debris that washed away during the November events? Where did it go and how bad is the resulting pollution? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. So um, it depends. A lot of the things like riprap or uh, the fill that's under the road is just essentially minerals. It's sand and gravel and rocks. And that's just mixed in with the other sediment in the streams. And it doesn't make much difference. There are certainly cases, you know, where there's uh, um, pieces of asphalt, for instance, and that isn't as good. Um, and there also is what I would call flood debris. So things like uh, you know, concrete barrage and stuff like that. Again, it's still pretty inert, but there's cars and there's pieces of buildings and there's, you know, tanks and stuff like that, all of which got moved around. And that's more of a problem. Fraser Valley Regional District actually, and uh, the BC Ministry of Environment actually have a reporting program in place where if you see anything like that when you're out and about, uh, near a river, you can phone it in and it'll get tagged for disposal. Someone will come and try and take it out before the freshet happens so it doesn't cause any more damage. So yeah, but um, probably the worst in terms of pollution were in places like Seamass Prairie or in Merritt, where because farms and houses and vehicles all have things like oil, and you know, farm chemical and home cleaners and stuff like that. And when that stuff gets mixed in with flood water, then it gets dispersed over a wide area and it can cause a lot of damage. So I have heard, for instance, that in the Sumas Prairie, when things like fertilizer were mixing with the flood waters and getting into barns that animals were trapped in, that actually some animals died from drinking water that had these chemicals mixed into that. But uh, the good news is a lot of that stuff got washed away and it got diluted in the process. So it caused a little bit of damage in a lot of places, but in terms of is it going, it's not doing things, for instance, like making the field so toxic that plants won't grow there anymore. You know, people are growing their crops. And from what I understand, they've done soil testing and there's a few areas that need to be remediated, but a lot of areas it's fine to continue. Um, we got a question from Ross. Did you know that the Ranger Run slide actually blocked the Chilliwack River briefly? Yes, I did know that. Actually, you can see it on the hydrograph. There's a little dip in the graph. And so because of that dip, we know that it happened, uh, you know, really early in the morning, a couple of hours after midnight, I think. And uh, but it's interesting, actually, the only reason that it blocked the river was because the river was so low at the time. It was flowing, you know, below 100 cubic meters per second at the time. So if the same slide had happened when the river level had been higher, it probably wouldn't have blocked the river because there'd be too much water flowing to block. So, yeah. Um, Mike says that he's from Pitt Meadows and constantly sees beaver activity along the dikes. Are the dikes being weakened by them? Oh, that's a good question. If they're properly designed, then they aren't. But uh, it's not the beaver so much, actually, because a beaver can't do much to the rocks in a dike. But if they are, you know, causing trees to fail, 
And if those trees are then dying and falling over and their roots are pulling up things, then yeah, that could cause some damage. But in general, when it comes to rivers and when it comes to flooding, beavers are more of a good thing than a bad thing. If our ecosystem is supporting beavers, it's probably good for fish as well. If it's good for fish as well, it's probably healthier than if it's a stream that doesn't have any of them. So yeah, I'm, I'm always happy when I see beavers in the slough near where I live because it means that there's enough animals in there for things like beavers to thrive, which is a good thing. Um, was there a king tide at the time of the November flood? And if so, what was the impact? That's from Geraldine. Oh, yes, yes, there was. Uh, we had king tides in Georgia Strait, um, but the effects on the valley were pretty minimal because Mission is about at the limit of where we see any tidal effect. And so um, it, and it wasn't really the Fraser that flooded the backwaters in, into these areas. It was water coming from the mountains, from the Cascades, you know, uh, down from the mountains to the valley bottom that was really causing these floods. So yeah, certainly when some of the flood debris came out and got into Fraser River and went down into uh, you know the Salish Sea and was then there was a definite increase in the amount of woody debris that was bobbing around in the Salish Sea. And when that got carried up onto the beaches by the king tides, then it did a lot of damage. So we saw things like you know holes in the seawall with collapsing uh, people's you know piers and uh, stuff like that were getting hit by wood in the waves and damaged. I haven't really talked about that because it wasn't in the valley, but certainly some of that did happen. Um, all right, we've got a couple. This is a big question, but it, yeah, sure. how much time do we have to go carbon negative before Earth is unlivable for humans? Ooh, that's a really good question. Uh, it's not particularly my area of expertise, but uh, Uninhabitable is, is a little more distant, probably not till after 2100. So, but long before Earth is uninhabitable, it'll be really, really, really unpleasant for us to live on. It won't be fun, even when it isn't uninhabitable. We might wish it was uninhabitable long before it becomes uninhabitable. So what we have to do is start bending the curve of our emissions down. And we need to do that really quickly by 2030. Thankfully, you know, under the current IPCC report, more governments than ever before are actually starting to take this seriously and are starting to do what's required in terms of spending money and making commitments to actually make it happen. So. I choose to be optimistic. I think it's going to be happen. I think it's going to be the battle of our lifetimes. And I think it finally is going to happen. And I really hope I am going to live to see the day when we're actually carbon neutral. I've got a question. Do you have any thoughts about how Fraser River tidal range and potential change in salt wedge moving up with river and whether it can influence further risks for disaster? Yeah. Hmm. Those are those are some some things combined together. So um, there was a study that came out back in the summer from uh, my colleagues at Northwest Hydraulic Consultants. Uh, they're another consulting consumption company. They're a lot bigger than Statlu. So they actually looked at how sea level rise and a one in five hundred year Fraser flood might work together in terms of areas that are flooded. That's a really easy study to Google. You can look it up and it'll tell you a little bit better than my recollection of it will. Uh, salt wedging is something else entirely from the rest of that. And what that is, is as sea level rises, the groundwater that's affected by seawater basically expands as well because higher sea gives more pressure on the groundwater. So as sea level rises, then the wells under places like Richmond have more likelihood of having salty water in them. But that's not really a factor in things like flooding and landslides. That's more got to do with, can we use this water and can we irrigate our crops with it or can we drink it safely, which is a little bit of a different issue. 
Um, we have a couple questions here that are actually pretty similar. They're about removing the trees stacked up in the Chilliwack River. One's about dredging the river during non-salmon spawning season. And the other one is, do you have any idea of where all the debris will be sorted, stored? Yeah, so there's been a lot of debris removal going on already in some places more so than others. So uh, Anderson River up by Boston Bar where it flows into the Fraser. I know there's been crews that have been down there removing debris from the river uh, already. They can get machinery down there. And that's one thing that uh, um, is really complicates debris removal is that you can only remove debris where you can get to it easily. Uh, there's a lot of places where you can't get to the riverbank to remove debris. I'm going to say as well, as a hydrologist, I think more wood in a river is in general a good thing and not a bad thing. It's a bad thing for people when it comes to navigating the river, but in terms of fish and in terms of sediment transport and in that type of thing, wood in rivers is a really good thing natural rivers that haven't been altered by humans that flow in forests often have a lot of wood in them. So wood is good for the river. What's bad is when that wood comes out, hits our boats, blocks our culverts, things like that. So we do have to move and we do have to remove some wood. And we probably this year, I would imagine, going to have to do some gravel removal from the vetter as well. That's a really tricky one. I touched on it earlier. Gravel removal is generally bad for fish. Uh, we can try and do it to minimize the, the bad effects on fish. And, you know, in the Vedder Canal, we've historically done it. We haven't done it since 2016, so six years with no gravel removal. And that's actually because they measure the amount of gravel coming in. And for the last six or 10 years or so, it's been decreasing. The gravel budget of the Vedder River and Vedder Canal was actually negative for the last six years, which means more gravel was going out than was coming in. So that's not necessarily good for fish either. But in this case, we don't know how much exactly how much gravel is coming yet. But I think that all those losses over the last, those natural losses over the last six years have been more than made up now. And so that's where we really have to look at some, you know, some danger to fish against some real actual flood danger to all our communities as well. And we have to make the decision about gravel removal with that in mind. It may be a case that if we do it now, that then we don't have to do it again for another 10 years or so. And that something like that, where it's targeted for as few times as possible is probably what's best for fish overall. So I hope I've answered your question. I've got a question from Jody. Going back to restoration is reconciliation. Are there politicians you're aware of who are open to this discussion and our possibility? And how do we as citizens ensure we do not just walk away from temporary solutions like the culverts you mentioned? Yeah, those are really good questions. Thanks for asking them. Uh, I'm not going to mention specific politicians. I think there's probably politicians of all parties that are willing to work on this and at all levels of government. So municipal, regional, provincial, federal, but no matter it's kind of a non-party issue in that it's something that you can raise with any politician and raise with any level of government. I've worked in government, I've worked as a consultant, and I know that what politicians respond to is they respond to letters. Letters more so than emails, emails that are handwritten, like written yourself rather than just a form. But if you have a concern about an issue and you contact your politician, make it known to them, get your friends to do it, it becomes an issue. And issues that get brought forwards to politicians get dealt with. They respond when people make noise. It's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. I'm involved with a little group called the uh, Friends of the Camp Hope Slough, and we've been working in Chilliwack to try and get our politicians to value Camp Slough and Hope Slough on Fairfield Island and some of Chilliwack's other waterways. And I feel like we're really making a difference. We've taken an issue that nobody seemed to care about, and we've made it one that all of Chilliwack's municipal politicians and some of our provincial and federal politicians as well have actually said, yes, that's worth addressing. We're willing to put money in the budget to address it. And I think that's the type of thing we need to look for at all the levels of government. So if it's something that's important to you, 
bring it forwards to your politicians, make it known to them, and don't take no for an answer. Keep bringing it up with them until they agree to deal with it. Um, all right. Uh, we've got a question from Valerie. Um, I've heard that the Fraser floods every 50-ish years and we were long overdue. How is it that social planning agrees for housing development to occur so close to the riverbank and this continues? What needs to change re uh, regarding development policy? Sure. So that uh, one in 50 thing is a little bit of, uh, um, I I've hoped that what I've communicated here makes that a little bit more clear. The really damaging floods on the Fraser River are the ones with a one in 50 or higher likelihood. So an AEP of 2% or less, but that doesn't mean they happen every 50 years. The most recent time we had a damaging flood was in 2011. It wasn't particularly large, but it went on for a long time. The river was at its flood stage for almost two months and it caused so much bank erosion that actually some BC hydro transmission towers in Surrey were undermined and fell over into the river and pulled all the wires down with them. Before that, you know, um, 1972 was a big flood. 1948 was what we think now is about a one in 200 year flood. 18, 1894 was about what we think is a, you know, maybe a one in 500 year flood in terms of return period and magnitudes. But uh, yeah, something like that could actually happen this year. All this, the conditions with respect to larger than average snowpack and colder than normal spring are in place right now. So we're all in the geoscience community paying a lot of attention to what's going on now with our weather and as our snowpack. The good news is if the Fraser is going to flood, we're going to have a couple of days of warning and we're going to be able to respond to it. If we hear that there's a big flood on the Fraser in Prince George, it means we've got about three days to get ready down here. Um, but with respect to, yeah, with respect to housing and stuff close to the riverbank, well, you know, I do some of the planning for work like that. In some cases, you have to say, no, it's not safe for you to be there. And in other cases, it's a case of, here's how high you have to build. And here's the sort of scour protection you need that if a flood does happen, it'll flood your land, but it won't destroy your house or carry it away. Mm, let's see, what effect did contaminated surface water that found its way through wells have on the underlying groundwater? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm more of a surface water hydrologist than a groundwater hydrologist, so take anything I say with a grain of salt. But uh, you know, it's certainly possible that contaminated water could make its way from the surface into wells, especially into shallow wells. Um, but it's not likely to be a permanent problem. It's likely to be the sort of problem you can address by testing and pumping until you've got the contaminants out. And the other issue is that when water moves from the surface to the subsurface and flows through the subsurface, the subsurface provides some level of natural filtration and natural bioremediation in the process. And there's also uncontaminated water in the groundwater already that will help mix and dilute that to the point where some of those contaminants will become non-hazardous in the process. So, yeah, it's an issue, but it's not an insurmountable issue. It's an issue that individual well owners might have to deal with, and it might affect their well for varying degrees of time, but I don't think it's likely to be render any wells permanently undrinkable forever. There are a number of hiking trails uh, in the Chilliwack River Valley. Is anyone monitoring these trails to make sure they're safe? Should these trails be avoided this spring and summer due to potential delayed risk of landslides? Ah, that's a really good question. Thanks for asking it. That's a, a special one to me. Um, so yes, there are trails that have been affected by floods and landslides. Uh, the Watt Creek Trail uh, near Teapot Hill has got some hang fire over it. It's been affected by landslides in the last couple of years and by floods. Um, further up the valley, uh, the road that leads to the Celeste Memorial Trailhead is completely gone about a kilometer from pavement. And so you can't drive to the trailhead. You might have to scramble through the forest uh, above where the road used to be for a couple hundred meters to get up there. And it's gonna take a lot of time. But you know, these are issues that uh, the agencies responsible for access. So Ministry of Forests and Ministry of Parks are well aware of and are dealing with on a priority basis. So 
uh, the ones that are most hazardous, I believe, are identified and posted with, you know, like a do not hike sign. And the other ones are going to be addressed as time permits. But I certainly wouldn't try to uh, hike, say, to Slessie Memorial right now or even possibly this summer unless you have the ability not only to bushwhack through the forest uh, above where the road used to be, but you have the ability to walk about 12k further too, which might make it into an overnight for some people. Thankfully, there are a lot of trails that weren't damaged. I've been up on Vetter Mountain. I've been up on Elk, you know, the community forest, um, Sumas Mountain trails. A lot of those came through without really any serious damage whatsoever. So it's not like our trails are all wiped out, but it's like we got fewer options right now. And so we need to uh, be cautious and if we see any damage, be prepared to reevaluate and go somewhere else if possible. A question here from Matthew. Uh, many of the lower Fraser pump stations seem to be designed to deal with normal summer floods and tributaries with the co high water in the Fraser River. However, they're not designed for high fall winter flows and tributaries and high water levels in Fraser River. Flooding in the lower Salmon River appear to have been largely driven by high Fraser River water. The pumps can only take 10% of upland flows and outflows rely on floodgates opening, but Fraser was so high for November that inland areas were flooded. Was this a factor of the failure of Sumas Dykes and that the floodgates cannot open to the Fraser, which is normally low in the winter? And would this be a normal trend to expect in the future with global warming, i.e. higher winter Fraser levels? Ooh, that was a mouthful. Ooh, that's a mouthful. Yeah, so um, it's no, it's no uh, secret that a lot of our, uh, our floodgates and uh, flood protection infrastructure along the lower Fraser is outdated. Um, I do a little bit of work with Watershed Watch and, uh, you know, with the uh, Fraser Valley Watersheds Coalition and groups like that. And so one best estimate is there's something like 1500 kilometers of salmon habitat that's been cut off by things like floodgates that aren't fish friendly. But thankfully, in our quest to modernize those and make them fish friendly, we can also modernize them to deal with the effects of climate change. And so, for instance, at uh, Mariah Slough on uh, Highway 7, just uh, the Mount Woodside side of Agassiz, there's some brand new flood infrastructure in place that is fish friendly and that was really effective in November at preventing flooding at high Fraser River water levels as well. And that's the type of thing we can see and will see installed in other places as well. Um, the only question is when uh, and where. There's a priority list for dealing with these things. And I think, again, it's a case of the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Uh, you know, if you have a particular spot you'd like to see, that's where you lo lobby your local politicians and encourage them to deal with it uh, sooner rather than later as well. Um, okay, we're kind of running out of time here, so let's just try and wrap. I found some more questions in the chat. Is Yarrow a flood concern? Oh, absolutely, Yarrow is a flood concern, yeah. So um, Yarrow is on essentially the other, it's on the same side, uh, the Sumas side of the Vetter dikes. And so not so much the Fraser, but the Sumas flooding can also affect Yarrow. And uh, you know, the floodwaters, when Sumas Prairie flooded in November, the floodwaters almost reached Yarrow. They stopped pretty much right along the Chilliwack-Abbotsford uh, border this time, but in another flood, they might come further. So yeah, absolutely, Yarrow's at risk. Yarrow's also at risk from flooding and landslides off of Vetter Mountain as well, and some of that happened during the storm. Uh, up on Majuba Hill, there was a debris flood that, you know, put like fist-sized gravel in buried people's yards. And so, yeah, all of that area has risks, both from flooding and from upslope hazards that need to be dealt with. And I would encourage all the residents of Yarrow uh, to think about that. And I would encourage potential residents of Yarrow to think about that as well and consider that when they're looking at things like purchasing a house. Um, but, asks sorry, I do have one more point to put in there. I don't wanna say that this is particular to Yarrow. You know, there's a saying in the geohazards community, and that is that there's no area on earth that is free from natural hazards. You know, whether it's flooding, landslides, 
earthquakes, you know, things like forest fires, hurricanes, disasters can happen, natural hazards can happen anywhere. It's just a question of which hazards and when they're going to happen. It's no secret that some areas are safer than others, but there's no area that's completely hazard free. So when I say, yes, there's hazards that can affect Yarrow, I don't want to pretend that Yarrow is the only place where those hazards can happen. Hazards can happen in Sardis, hazards can happen in Mission, hazards can happen in Chilliwack, in Hope, in Abbotsford, in Langley, in Matsqui, anywhere. You know, it's just a question of which ones and how often. At the start of your talk, you mentioned a paper that will soon be released about the future change uh, of an increase in the occurrence of precipitation atmospheric rivers. What is the name of the author and the title of the paper? Yeah, it actually was published. It came out just recently in the last couple of months. Uh, I don't have it off the top of my head. It's something I follow a bunch of hydrologists on Twitter, and it's something that I saw on Twitter within the last month. Um, I can Google it really easily, and maybe I'll put a link to that up on Statley's social media pages so people can look there and find it. Excellent. What can municipalities and residents, residents do to prepare for the flood season this coming year to protect lives? Ooh, that's a really good question. Yeah, um, so governments can do things like check waterways, you know, look at culvert and bridge design, uh, ensure that those things are functional, do things like planning, take an inventory of what they've got, look at what expected flood sizes should be, upgrade the ones that are most undersized. Individual people can do things like, you know, do things like clearing ditches on your property, making sure that if water flows on, it has somewhere to go that isn't going to come to your house. You know, um, I don't want to sound biased, but a lot of what geoscientists like Statley do is hazard assessments for people's residential developments. So usually that only comes in when somebody's looking for a development permit or a building permit and they want to build something new and they want to know how to build it safe. It's, we don't do a lot of it, but it's possible. We can do those for existing developments as all. Well. So, you know, if you want a quote, come and talk to us and we can give you one uh, to, to do an assessment of your property, see what hazards are likely to occur and if there's any way you can protect yourself against them. But I don't say just come to Statloop, come to any qualified geoscientists in BC. You can look up, there's a list of us on the association website. Can we expect the Chilliwack River at or near Edwards Road to continue to erode and carve out the area at or near Chilliwack Lake Road? Yeah, that's a really good question. So if you know the area, you know that uh, after the flood, uh, they came and put riprap along the, the side of the road where the river came right up to the road. But you'll also see that to either side of that riprap section where the bank is unprotected, it is continuing to erode. And yes, it is going to continue to erode until someone protects it or until the river either is diverted or diverts itself to flow away from there. Because the bank in those areas is a thick layer of sand over gravel and that sand is really erodible. It moves easily. And you can see it crumbling and falling in, and you can see a couple of trees that have been undermined and fallen in as well. Um, let's take this as our last question here from Geraldine. Is it possible for you to give your opinion on the four proposals made by Abbotsford to mitigate flooding? Ooh, that's a really detailed question. I have seen the four proposals, and I have to say some of them seem more realistic than others. All of them depend on other levels of government spending a lot of money. And I think what actually is going to get done is going to depend on the willingness of other levels of government, both Canadian and American, to fund the work. If the funds aren't available, the work won't get done. But I have to say, the one I personally like best is the one that has a dedicated floodway from the border to the Fraser because floodways have worked in other places you know they've worked in the prairies in places like calgary and uh, winnipeg and furthermore because we know that the area within a floodway is going to flood we planned for it and so when we have a dedicated floodway we can restore some of the area in it to be more of a wetland and less of a developed area and that 
has an ecosystem recreate restoration component as well as a flood protection component. So yeah, of those three, I personally like the floodway one best, but with its price tag, I don't know if it will be the one that is pursued or not. Great. Well, um, thank you so much, Drew. Um, and thanks, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed this. Thanks for coming tonight uh, for our Earth Week presentation. I'm so pleased that you all joined us and stuck around for the Q&A too. Um, and we hope that you'll come see some more of our stuff. Statler is doing a kids presentation on Friday for Earth Day. Uh, so if any of you have kids, tell their teachers to bring their class to that presentation. You can find it online. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Thanks for me too. I really enjoyed doing this. Bye everybody. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you.